Hello everybody and welcome to Let's Talk Assassin's Creed, your normal podcast for all things Assassin's Creed. Good evening everybody and welcome to episode 120 of Let's Talk Assassin's Creed. Um, Declan, do you like history? Why am I playing Assassin's Creed? <laughs> <laughs> that is an excellent answer. I like history. I've, I've read the occasional history book and I enjoy the, uh, the historical tourism aspect of Assassin's Creed. But what about if you wanted to know a bit more about history in a, on a deeper level, like the real history? Um, who would you need? You'd need people that actually know what they're talking about, who actually have studied this stuff and visited the places. Um, so tonight we are going to talk about teaching through gaming. Um, and we're joined by a returning guest who I think has probably been on the show three times, four times, I'm not sure. Uh, welcome back to the show, Amit. Uh, yes, this is probably my fourth time. People are going to be tired of hearing my voice and my opinions, but hello. Um, this is Amit. Uh, the real name is Kate Miniti, and my qualifications are I am a gamer and an archaeologist and a PhD candidate at the University of British Columbia. I like the way you said gamer first. That's great. <laughs> the, the the academic stuff that's that's kind of a side side hustle you know you won't believe it but i've been a gamer much longer than i've been an <laughs> academic <laughs> that's fantastic thank you amit and welcome to the show uh, a new guest uh, dr brianna jackson welcome hi thank you uh yes i am brianna jackson i have a phd in egyptian art and archaeology from new york university and i am currently um teaching at baruch college and also pratt institute here in new york uh, art history and Roman history is supposed to be Egyptian history, but <laughs> they forgot and now it's Roman history. Oh, wow. So suddenly changed the topic sort of mid-semester <laughs> or something. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Surprise. <laughs> <laughs> do, you know, do you know what that means, Declan? Do you know why our podcast is amazing? Because we uh, have more qualified Egyptologists than any other Assassin's Creed podcast. It's fantastic. <laughs> I was just going to say... It just reminds me of what I would do, you know. Let's teach about Egyptian history. Get on the subway, lose my plans, but hey, surprise, it's about Roman now. <laughs> That's how I do the podcast half the time, you know. We're doing this this week. Oh, I've lost my plans. Surprise, we'll do this one instead. Are you we're suggesting doing? that the uh, the professors wing it? <laughs> I wing it. <laughs> I, no. I cannot confirm nor deny. <laughs> <laughs> no, of course, of course not. not. Of course not. Of course no. not. <laughs> Nobody does. <laughs> but can I can I say um, that Brianna has been a pioneer in the field because she did archaeo gaming before archaeo gaming was cool. Oh, right. thank you, Kate. So, well, let's start there. Well, I'll tell you what. We'll just very briefly mention, um, and we'll, we'll definitely put links to this in in the uh, in the YouTube notes and so on. Um, Amit and Brianna, I've been watching your um, Save Ancient Studies Twitch streams for the last, I think you've been doing them for a few months now, um, and they are fantastic. They are both fun to watch, but they're also educational. Um, so why don't we talk about that? And, and on your YouTube channel, Brianna, you've got you've been playing um, Origins mm -hmm. and, and sort of capturing the whole story and the whole game, plus other games, which we can definitely come to, um, for like, more than a year, maybe. Um, mm -hmm. So go right back to the start. Where, where did this Archeo gaming start from? Uh, well, for me, I, I wouldn't say that I, I'm a pioneer. I think Kate was being a little too generous with that, but I love it anyway. Um, it was more of an intention back in 2014. Uh, I had this idea to use the city builder game Pharaoh as a, as a teaching tool um, to teach the urbanization and the rise of civilizations and the development of the state. Um, I, uh, I sent out uh, some feelers on, a, on a, um, a gaming forum and some people were interested, not too many people replied, but that's okay. Um, but this was back when you still had to kind of hide the facts in academia if you played video games. <laughs> I mean, unfortunately, oh. yeah, that, that was something that you had to keep to yourself. Um, so I didn't really do anything with that. I always wanted to. And then in 2020, just Archeo Gaming became so major and I was a little bit bitter <laughs> when it became very popular because I was just like, man, I wanted to do this several years ago, but it, it, wasn't, a, it wasn't a thing back then. I'm, I'm going to ask a question. And, and if the answer is awkward silence, we'll just move on. So are, are there, are there some, some stuffy old profs who turn their nose up at 
gamers and you know all these silly things people are doing with their their consoles and their controllers well interestingly yes. enough it was uh I Amit, was that, Amit, was that a yes there in the background <laughs> <laughs> yes <laughs> well, for me, for me personally, I didn't bring it to any professors, but it was my um, peers uh, that were kind of s sticking their noses up at this. And uh, so it was, it was, I mean, it, you would expect that among your peers, and I mean, like fellow, this was back when I was still a student, your, your fellow students would find things interesting, mm. new things interesting, but it was even among that group. Um, people were quite stuffy about it and uh they, they, they I, got, I got some withering looks from my fellows <laughs> for sure <laughs> but uh luckily i haven't had any um superiors or or you know older professors um speaking against it which was nice i didn't i don't think i really introduced it to them though fair enough yeah same but you you will see on social media sometimes um you know big big names um saying that uh we cannot teach with these things and everything else but i i don't okay we're we're getting we're getting already meta here i don't <laughs> think that these things are intended as educational educational tools apart from the discovery tools but i think we can make them into teaching tools if we use them the right way which yeah. means without facing them you know at, at taking them at, at face value um which is something that we were actually talking where were we talking about this because i've already had this conversation with brianna but i don't remember when we were saying this, this was, i think it's like every day we, it's like yeah an, it's like an every day or every, yeah, week also every situation day. whining yeah, about <laughs> bemoaning <laughs> You know what's interesting? The, the I would say that the first game that was ever used as a teaching tool was Where in the World is Carmen Sandiego back in the 1980s. Oh my god. Oh Whoa. my god. Mm -hmm. my I know that TV cartoon series, but there was a game for it, was there? Yeah, I think it was uh, Where on Earth, maybe it was what oh, it was wow. called. Um, but it was introduced in schools to help teach geography, which was quite interesting. So that might have been the, the first, uh, yeah, I think that might have been the first game. Of course, we all played uh, the Oregon Trail as a quote-unquote teaching tool about... <laughs> oh, yeah, we... <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, expansion. Is it, is it like, was it like more American? Because I, I, I knew of the existence of that game, but like it doesn't, oh, it doesn't yeah. evoke I guess big nostalgia so. for me because I, I had no ties to it. <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a, I guess it's definitely an American uh, 1990s thing. Mm. Mm. Yeah, <laughs> I don't, I don't <laughs> remember hearing of it in the UK, but then oh. I went to a very old-fashioned school where there wasn't really any computers. It was kind of like like you were describing. It was kind of frowned upon, and we teach classical mm. history the classical way. So face the front, <laughs> face the blackboard, and take notes, students. Um, so yeah, it, it was. I probably went to the wrong school for that kind of a progressive <laughs> <laughs> teaching style. <laughs> progressive, I love it. <laughs> <laughs> So what 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 flipped in 2020 then in terms of was it just there was sudden this groundswell or or did someone go to a conference and say actually if you if you look at these these games on the positive way instead of focusing on what's wrong with them factually or, or whatever if you focus on what they do right they are valuable so how did that change well, from what I understand, um, I mean, it, it, you have Andrew Reinhardt, who literally wrote the book on Archeo Gaming. Uh, I think this was published in 2018. Um, mm -hmm. uh, and we could, so... We could put the link uh, in, the, in the episode description, because mm -hmm. it's a great book. And it's very yes. interesting. Yes. Share, and... share the link with me afterwards, um, Amit, on Discord, and I will add it to the, to the show notes on, on YouTube, of course. So I think this started to gain some interest uh, academically, but I, I should also mention that there's actually game studies, a game studies discipline that exists, but uh, in the archaeological humanities stuff, uh, this this wasn't really a thing. Um, but yeah, when when archaeo gaming started to to um, what am I trying to say here? <laughs> I think after his book, people were thinking, hey, you know, I also had this idea. And it was kind of like the scholars were individually thinking, oh, somebody else is doing this too. And 
they've kind of just been doing it in the closet, I guess. <laughs> and then it started to <laughs> emerge slowly but surely. Uh, but oh then God, in 2020... We, we can talk to our peers about this now without getting funny looks. <laughs> yes, yeah. yes. And I, and I think what, what happened with 2020 is obviously the, the pandemic with the quarantine and mm. everything was becoming so digital. And then some scholars, they finally realized, oh, you know, games can be cool. And so they would... Uh, uh, not hire, um, they would invite some big name popular scholars to go through the discovery tour. Uh, in one instance, I saw somebody actually have, uh, you had to like get tickets, maybe online tickets to watch um, this, uh, this playthrough of a, of a discovery tour thing, which I thought was really annoying because, well, I'm really going in here. I thought it was really annoying because you have gamers on YouTube who provide this stuff for free or you don't need to so someone was charging for it i don't think they were charging but it was just they were kind of they just had limited i uh, see i see virtual tickets you know yeah and gotcha i thought that was really bizarre and i was like no games are for everyone why mm. are you doing mm. ticket crap i mean that's so dumb but yeah i think with 2020 <laughs> and then it became everybody else wanted to do it oh you know i want to try out this game and i want to see what they're doing wrong so i can complain about it um yeah sorry i'll let uh, kate speak <laughs> no no i was i was listening like i uh i i also remember that in uh it was 2019 because we weren't in um lockdown yet um there was a uh, one of a small-ish um, conference on Archeo Gaming organized by right. the Archeo Gaming Collective, which was my first introduction to, you know, a more scholarly approach to it. Um, and now I'm part of the collective myself. So mm -hmm. it was like moving towards 2020, there was a big push towards these things. And then, um, you know, once, once it became more um, mainstream, let's put it this way, Mm. Uh, then people started and then everyone started doing all of these. But once again, it's the way you use it. Like if you're just mm, critiquing something that is not intended to be uh, like a, a history lesson, then what is the point? Like, what are you getting out of it? Right. Mm. And because we're all good at being distracted. Yeah, let me, uh, let me make a, uh, <laughs> yeah, let me make a comment there. There's enough people criticizing video games all the time anyway, Lord. without, <laughs> without getting into the whole historical accuracy discussion oh, so yeah <laughs> <laughs> i want to ask yeah. you about historical accuracy but we'll come to that go on declan <laughs> so one question that's been on my mind for quite a while before i even knew knew Arcule gaming's a thing is it possible in um because i've seen the meetings for years that the whole assassin's creed franchise has been in the forefront of teaching history through gaming because you see memes all over people say, oh yeah, I've been to Italy, we got lost, and my friend found his way to a certain landmark because he's played Assassin's Creed 2. And wow. when you look at Assassin's Creed, you've got the um, codex as all like historical location. And I don't know, was Assassin's Creed the first series to challenge the idea of let's teach history through gaming and keep it enjoyable? I think this one's for you, Kate. <laughs> Anybody. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, I think like what Assassin's Creed did is that it, especially Origins, when it came out, it had to be at the forefront of quote unquote teaching history with games because it was one of the first times that you could have a very immersive experience in a very large open world. Um, with kind of historical pretenses in which you could go around and uh, see, you know, and talk to ancient people, interact with ancient people as one of them rather than, uh, you know, traveling back in time or being a king building up a city. And then when the Discovery Tour came out, came out that was like, you know, the cherry on top. Uh, so, and it has brought people into history because even when you're, if you're, if you're not doing a discovery tour, when you're just going around, they give you little tidbits of history and they yeah. show you those, you know, those beautiful images, uh, the reconstructions of the cities, of how the pyramids were built and everything else. So in a sense, like it's been, it's the, can we say it's the gateway drug um, 
<laughs> to we history can definitely for some say people that. <laughs> and to gaming for others because um, I got into Assassin's Creed through Origins because I never played an Assassin's Creed game before, but oh, I had studied technology. So, you know, so I was like, oh, this game looks interesting and this Egypt looks convincing. So um, was it was it the <laughs> Egyptian setting that made you buy the game, basically? I didn't buy it at the beginning. I played it in my roommate's room. Oh, I remember you saying, my... yes, yes. <laughs> gotcha. On her Xbox. Uh, yeah. But yeah, it was the Egyptian setting. I was like, this Egypt looks more convincing. So I want to see what this is about. Gotcha. Um, and the protagonist is not a white man. So that was also interesting to me. Mm. Mm. Uh, does that answer the question, though? I just I just went all over the place. Um, it does, because as a, um, as a guy who's been playing since the first ones, you know, I was similar to you, you know, I picked as I screen one, not just because I love Prince of Persia and I wanted to try another game by the developers, but the crusade is one of my favorite moments in history, just because how mad it is, you know, I think it was about five crusades, just for no for no reason, just some crazy guy in, a, in power just wanted to go on a mad crusade for like tons of years with no success, and having a game that visit the crusade that wasn't you know diluting it wasn't it making his um hollywood you know make it over the top it just give you your real sense of this would be jerusalem dakra during the crusade it kind of does make you want to play the games more and egypt i only knew history from egypt through blue um the bible and horrible histories but having discovery to and learning more was Kind of weird. <laughs> I didn't expect to stab dudes and learn history at the same time. No, quite right. Quite right. For me, it I was think... very similar, Declan. Oh, sorry, Brianna, go on. Oh, um, I'm probably going on a tangent from what you guys are saying then. I mean, I'm, I am going back to the original question and that I think... Um, we, don't, we don't have a script. It doesn't matter. <laughs> <laughs> I think with Discovery Tour, it is... Well, I, I mean, I'm not... A hardcore gamer so i've not played everything out there but i think with discovery tour it is a first conscious choice to teach history whereas uh in other games that are set in history or based on historical uh events i think it's more you have to ask the question of intention of the developers which is one of my favorite questions to ask uh are they intending to teach or are they just choosing something that's interesting and adding factual um, stuff to it. Uh, I think of something like Crusader Kings, um, where it has a lot of historical figures in it, but are they really trying to teach that history or are they just trying to make it something that's realistic and in that case, uh, more immersive? I don't know. That, do you know that? that I mean, I've got so many questions. We've got to, we've got to, we have, we've got to try it, I suppose, and and uh, have some kind of structure. So, um, although this is an Assassin's Creed podcast, we do not have to just talk about Assassin's Creed. So maybe you could let, let's take that uh, that tangent. What other games are you playing, or have you played in the last few years that you would say, if you want to experience the history, or a, you know, a fairly well, I don't want to say accurate because that word gets misused terribly, but should we say a representative version of history that would make you feel like the history has come alive? What kind of other titles would you throw out there for people to, to go and explore? Let me look at my list here. <laughs> Opening <laughs> up my... <laughs> Are we going to hear like a big game. thud as a massive sort of tome? Is <laughs> yeah. Um, um. Actually, funny you should ask that, uh, because we have been working with Sasa on a teaching module mm. on ancient civilizations and ancient urbanization using games that are not Assassin's Creed. So mm. we do have the answer to that. Okay. <laughs> Several answers, in fact. City builders. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Those are my favorite. Oh, yeah. I'm, also, I'm finally getting my dream of teaching people about urbanization with Pharaoh because of this, <laughs> this teaching awesome. module. Yeah. Um, but yeah, uh, city builders, like uh, not just the ones about Egypt, like Pharaoh and Builders of Egypt, which is very, very new. They're still not finished with that yet, but the, mm -hmm. the, the prologue is really great. Uh, but there's so also difficult. Children of the Nile. There's um, Pre-Dynastic Egypt, which kicked everybody's ass. Oh my God. Like, oh don't, even, God. don't even start. <laughs> They've made a game about Pre-Dynastic Egypt. Yes, it's, it's fantastic. 
It's so wow. difficult. It's so difficult. I've never been so frustrated at a game <laughs> <laughs> in my entire life. Oh. Um, but also the there's a... Kingdom. Yes, <laughs> there is. I haven't even started that one because I'm, I'm just... I'm traumatized by. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, it's it's. <laughs> you you can do everything right and still lose. So, yes. You know. <laughs> um, but there's new uh, Mesopotamian games, which is a a, a genre, or not a genre, um, a, a historical place, civilization, groups of civilizations that aren't really explored in games, except for I guess Prince of Persia is one. <laughs> um, and, uh, but the two city builders, one called Sumerians, uh, it's, it's one guy who is the developer and then Nebuchadnezzar, which is another independent developer team. Um, these are both city builders and they're really interesting, um, the way they present ancient Mesopotamia. Uh, so those are good, I would say. <clears throat> there are, um, a few older ones, um, about Rome. Uh, mm -hmm. There's like Civ City Builder, which is very uh, like the nitty gritty of like building a, a city and making sure that everyone has access to sanitation and water and food. And, you know, and you need to make sure that people actually go and get the food somewhere and everything mm -hmm. else. But once again, city builders. But the problem with city builders is that most in most of the cases you are playing as a ruler. Mm -hmm. And also, you can't really go around your town unless, you know, over zoom in and just follow uh, the people around. But you're not really experiencing it yeah. as one of the people. Whereas the big um, attractive of Assassin's Creed, I think, at least for me, was like actually being in the, you know, in the moment, vibing with the ancients, uh, mm -hmm. and, you know, um, and that part of the thing, because you're not, I mean, you're still upper you know, upper class person, but you're not a king who makes decisions and decides, you know, which temple to build and what to, you know, which yeah. which things are we planting this year and everything else. It's a different, it's a different experience, a different kind of game. Um, mm -hmm. but I suppose the nearest are... I would have from my history, uh, my gaming history would be the Total War series and mm -hmm. especially Rome Total War, which I have mm -hmm. played thousands of hours of, um, <laughs> you know, building up the cities. I didn't know what a Latifundia was until I played um, Rome Total War or, you know, the different levels of sewerage systems or what tax farmers were. Yes, I appreciate this is very light history. We're not going into the depths of it, but it does, I suppose these games don't need to teach specific topics. They just need to open your mind. Maybe that's a way of looking at it. Um, go on, Declan. I just wanted to go on off on the biggest tangent ever possible. Can we make an Assassin's Creed city builder? I don't play city builders, but could you imagine building a city like Messiah in a giant city builder with mm -hmm. maybe mechanics from civilization where you just like send factions of assassins out? It's totally random, but I'm just now imagining a city builder for Assassin's Creed. That, that, doesn't Ubisoft have a series called Anno that does exactly that, I think? Basically. I have no idea. Yeah, yes. I think so. <laughs> Don't yeah. play city builders. That, I'm not smart enough for them. Have I'm you never admit, played SimCity? <laughs> I can't play Reckon, it. Have you never like, played SimCity? We all know that SimCity ends in fire and destruction. Crash well, airplanes. Sometimes, yeah. yes, but oh man. Yeah. I mean, a volcano <laughs> under the under the, the city hall. Yeah, I mean, who amongst us hasn't, right? I I tried to play Sim, sim Farm is the best sim. I tried to play Sim City on mobile last year, and I actually rage quit because my houses kept getting burgled because I wasn't building fire stations or police stations close enough. There wasn't enough power. There wasn't enough water. Everyone was dying. Everyone was unhappy. I was like, screw this. Get robbed. I'm quitted. I can't do it. I'm not smart enough. <laughs> they, are, they are annoying. Uh, and that's, that's why I usually end up killing everyone anyways. <laughs> I remember we in, in eighth grade we were given the opportunity to play SimCity 2000 after we completed our typing exercises, and I'm really bad at typing, so I could never play the game. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, I had that game on our very first PC in about ninety five, ninety four. I'm not sure when SimCity 2000 came out, but I think it was on two floppy disks or something crazy like that. 
Mm. And probably half the people listening don't know what a floppy disk is, but yeah, whatever. Look it up on Wikipedia. <laughs> um, yeah, brilliant game. <laughs> um, I did have a question. It was on the tip of my tongue and it's gone. Declan, have you got something you can say that will make this sound really slick? Yes. The topic you want to discuss, because I need to discuss it. Now we've got historians here because it's on my lips. Please, can we talk about historical accuracy? Can't because you said historical accuracy. <gasps> I have been dying how to dis- you. I have been dying to discuss how hilarious it is that people argue sometimes that like Sanskrit Odyssey doesn't have historical accuracy, even though in some scriptures there was giant ants in the Peloponnesian War. <laughs> there was no such thing. So, my question is: the historical accuracy. How could you be one hundred percent sure that the history you read is real when some dude writes about giant ass ants? How can we trust history when I don't believe giant ants exist? And if they do, I am now terrified because I hate spiders and I don't like ants. <laughs> Don't okay, like so ants. Let's let's start let's start the Herodotus slander. <laughs> Poor guy, not even around here to defend himself, you know. <laughs> um, uh, apart from Herodotus, uh, I mean, uh, historical accuracy is is one of those big words that people fill their mouth with uh, without without being really sure what they mean. Um, in a series like Assassin's Creed that is based on a very sci-fi premise of an ancient superior civilization that literally creates, creates humans and has mind-controlling objects and shrouds that can save people or explode them. You know, depends. Mm-hmm. Medicine. It's medicine. That's how medicine works, I'm told. <laughs> um, and, you know, and all sort of like a crazy trees in which you can insert yourself in virtual reality um (laughs) if that is the premise then historical accuracy is out of the window right there needs to be and i'm going i'm going to quote my wife on this there needs to be internal consistency in the narrative and the word Mm -hmm. building but it does not need to be 100 percent you know realistic and like true to true to life in Assassin's Creed 2 you punch the pope in the face now i'm going to tell you someone has indeed punched the pope in the face because Shara Colonna went in and punched pope Boniface VIII in the face and that is recorded that is history that happened but that was not you know there was an exception and not the rule so there are... that was not a young man from Firenze is that what you're telling us no he was an angry man from Rome so <laughs> <laughs> Could have been an assassin, maybe. But like, if we accept that we live in a world where shiny artifacts can mind control people and gods can reincarnate, and giant spoiler alert, of course, because blah, 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 uh, then we also need to accept that female warriors exist, that a female Spartan warrior who fights without a shield, which was the most incredible thing for me, can exist, right? Yeah. So I think yeah. that in the case of Assassin's Creed, historical accuracy is thrown there as, um, how can we say, a thinly veiled critique of the fact that these games have become more inclusive mm. than just white men. That's it. I said it. I'm gone. <laughs> that is actually what you've said there. You've explained far better than I could. And I've seen this argument many times, which is, People will say, playing as Cassandra breaks my immersion. Okay, but you're fine with the Minotaur. That's what you're telling me. I don't (laughs) think this is an immersion problem, my friend. I think you're probably a misogynist. But anyway. I I think it's a problem. Like, I had, like, when I saw Cassandra at the symposium, the back of my mind, the history, like, the archaeologist's back of my mind was like, this would never happen in ancient Greece because no decent woman would go to a symposium on her own. But then again, I remembered that she has like Leonidas' spear and she can cause earthquakes. So I was like, okay, you know what? I'm going to take a step back and just enjoy the symposium. <laughs> right. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Do you know, that's okay. So here's, here's my, uh, my next question for you both then. So Amit, we, we, are, uh, we are friends on UbiConnect. And whenever I look at the leaderboards for Origins in terms of time played, people killed, 
distance traveled you are way at the top of the leaderboards you've played through origins many times brianna you, you started origins last year i think and you've been playing through it and finishing it on the streams recently so when yes. you're both playing it are you are you able to turn off your your historian brain and just enjoy the game and hack and slash and have some fun or, or are you always spotting the little things ah oh, that vase is wrong that decoration is wrong um, can you still enjoy the games as games it's it's both uh luckily for us because we play games anyway uh it's it's easy for us to be like oh okay well that's wrong but i am having a great time right now <laughs> uh i think with with people who aren't gamers they would find that more challenging but i definitely find issues like uh for the for instance the last stream that we did we were in uh <laughs> fake amarna which is fine it's fine i um, wanted to ask about amarna were, yes <laughs> there were random cartouches that didn't make sense to me why they would have them in there uh when they could easily have used real ones if they're going to render something why not render the real one and i mean they had an egyptologist consulting why didn't they ask him um, or them? Uh, I don't know how many were consulting, but um, yeah, I just, uh, so sometimes that kind of is frustrating. Sometimes it's amusing. Like when I went into Smenkka Ray's tomb and I saw Amenhotep the third's <laughs> name and I was like, well, that's just all kinds Oops. of wrong, but uh, it's, it's funny. <laughs> Smenkka Ray, uh, was he, yeah. he was the bent pyramid, wasn't he? No, right? no, he he was the successor of Akhenaten. Ah, okay. Yeah. Allegedly. <laughs> Allegedly. Allegedly. I we discounted Nefer Oh, no, the Bent Pyramid was Sneferu, wasn't it? I'm I'm yes. getting my pharaohs beginning with S mixed up. Yeah. <laughs> I'll have to, re to have to redo the class, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but then there are those moments when you see something and you're so excited about it because you were just hoping that they would have gotten it right. Uh like when I saw Amarna and I burst into tears, essentially. <laughs> I would, no, I will tell you, Amit knows because she was watching the chat. I was watching the stream and I clipped that reaction because it was priceless. <laughs> like you were, you, your mind was blown at this recreation of this ancient yes. city, you know, in the in the game. It was fantastic. <laughs> It was really great. And then you go to Hermopolis, of course, and I hate it and set it on fire. I, I knew. I knew you would go there. I was waiting for I, you to mention Hermopolis <laughs> and the criminal lack of baboons in that city. I, 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 can't, I can't get over it. I, I lie awake at night. <laughs> now, for, for those of us in the audience who maybe don't know Egypt as well, where is Hermopolis in the game and what is it in real life and what's wrong with it? Well, uh, in, in reality, it's in kind of like Middle Egypt. Um, in the game, everything is kind of, the geography is kind of squished. So yes. a lot of things are closer than they are uh, in reality. Now, Amarna is uh, across the river from Hermopolis and a little bit further south. Um, so I was, when I first encountered Hermopolis, I was very worried I would get to Amarna sooner than I wanted to. But and then, of course, Amarna is in the afterlife. So... <laughs> <laughs> Didn't have to worry about that. Um, but Hermopolis was the cult site of the god Thoth, or Jehuti. He was the god of wisdom. Uh, he was a lunar god. Uh, it was also a cult site for the Ogdoad, which is uh, four uh, pairs of gods. One of them is Amun, one, and his, uh, com his, his uh, counterpart is Amunet. Uh, so Aya is Amunet. Yeah, um, which is very interesting. Um, and uh, Thoth took the form of an ibis, uh, which is a bird with a long hooked beak. And then uh, he also took the form of a baboon. Uh, now, in and I know I'm getting really historical here, but in this Hermopolis, is great. Carry on. <laughs> there are these colossal baboons, just huge, huger. If that's a word, I don't know. Anyway, they are bigger than the ones that are in the game, and they are—they uh, were erected by Amenhotep the Third, and they are supposed to be him as uh, the baboon god Thoth. And so I was really looking forward to seeing Amenhotep the Third's baboons, and I was disappointed. So I set them on fire every time I see them. Gotcha. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Special pilgrimage at the start of every gaming session. Yes. Gotcha. We, we do not endorse arson in real life, but we strongly endorse arson no, in video we, games. We do not. We do not. 
so I'm trying to think. So if I'm I, I'm picturing in my head the the in game map of Origins, we've got Memphis sort of in the center of the Nile. We've mm-hmm. got Alexandria at the the mouth of the Nile. Where would Hermopolis? And then we've got um, Fayum in the south. Where would uh, Hermopolis be in in reference to those three main cities? It's further south, which is correct in in the game map. Okay, yeah. right, understood. Mm-hmm. Oh, it's the the southernmost. I think it's the southernmost uh, province of uh, that we see in game. Yeah, um, right. It would have been absolutely fantastic to go down, you know, to Kush, but unfortunately, yes. no time. Well, <laughs> I mean, we did get Abu Simbel. <laughs> oh my God! Yes, yeah. so um, in Hermopolis. <laughs> right? That's that's the other thing. You go to Hermopolis and you have and you have six flags Abu Simbel. Um, and it's, it's baffling. Uh, that is one of the things that breaks breaks the immersion because historical accuracy hurt her. Uh, but uh, that's like that's that's a step too far. Uh, I can I'm fine with smaller baboons. Brianna is clearly not. Uh, but hey, I look, draw we, the line. We each have our breaking point, okay? Right. And those baboons I draw were the too line small. At Abu Simbel being there because yep. yeah, no, they could have used they could have taken the, the model of any temple, but why Abu Simbel, which is like so iconic and recognizable? I have beef with that as well. Now that I it think was, of it, like I was oh. confused. I was just like, is there a temple like this? Am I just imagining that this is a copy of Abu Simbel in Hermopolis? And I'm like, I need to go uh, examine the geography of that region, and there aren't even cliffs like that in Hermopolis. Like what? <laughs> Uh, but that's okay whatever whatever it's fine we'll we'll allow it because it's a game it's the animus yes. just yes. messing things up that's what it is yes true yes <laughs> so another thing that i wanted to ask and i am now just realizing why there was no but i didn't even see baboons and origins i'm I'm going to be honest with you, Declan, I've not spotted them before either, but I am replaying Origins and I'm going to be looking out for the baboons. <gasps> baboons. There is a criminal a criminal lack of baboons. The police use the baboons. Baboons. <laughs> um, oh, they're statues, I should note. The statues uh, of the baboons? Yeah. I'm going to have to look yeah, out for them. Baboon statues, not actual. <laughs> so, one of the questions um, that I've seen pop up a lot of times, and I think it does have, you know, a historical significance, is... Um, I'm gonna use Valhalla because it's the big one that um, um, big one that's the biggest map, and that's distance. So people complain that Valhalla is too big, but historically, if you're gonna play a game and get immersed, is it better from a historical point to make a world that's smaller, more fishbowl, so you can see more landmarks, or keep it bigger so you can actually explore like different areas of different cities? So if with Egypt, if everything was like fishbowl, so Giza was right next door to Siwa, would that break historical immersion more than a bigger map? If that makes sense. I think I'm rambling. <laughs> no, that makes sense. Um, I mean, for me, it wasn't a problem because it, it is condensed. Uh, it wasn't really that big of a deal. And I think it's, it's useful in that if you haven't unlocked fast travel, you don't want to be riding your horse for you know five uh hours <laughs> to get from one place to another but it is kind of weird to me that someone would complain that a world is too big for an open world game i mean usually that's a selling point uh i would imagine but i mean that's just just me uh, i think one of the one of the issues with valhalla is that the uh and i i remember one of the first conversation i had with james about this is that the open world is very very uh monotonous mm. it's very similar terrains very similar you know poem, mountains and cliffs and people that you meet whereas the i think the saving grace of origins is that it is it is um different because yeah. you have the deserts and then you have cliffs and then you have oases and then you have you know the nile going around and then you go to Cyrenaica and it's fantastic and beautiful and lush uh, so there is more variety in terms of terrain and animals and people that you can meet as opposed to Valhalla, which, no offense, is England. So it's not that Oh, it's well done. De- Declan and I are both British, and feel free to criticize Britain. It's pretty boring. <laughs> Sorry to, like, jump on a tangent, but I live near the Lake District, and I kid you not, the nearest town to me is about 20 miles away. I'm in the city, and they just keep getting further and further. And if you go to the blue country, like, there's now but the same freaking field 50 times over. Keswick is about 20 yeah. minutes, and when you yeah. get to Keswick, 
it's about, about 40 miles of the same fields, and once you saw one tree, you've seen them bloody all. Oh, they're all hills. Yeah. <laughs> it's just yeah. hills. It's the most boring oh, landscape I've ever been to. There's definitely, like, I, I've read criticisms of, I mean, of course, you, there's always criticisms. Like People will often say, Origin's world is boring because it's just desert. But to me, well, the, even the deserts are <laughs> stunning in Origin's. That, that bright golden sand or even the bright white sand in the far south of the map mm. the blue sky i just think it's amazing i think it's absolutely beautiful and origins is a beautiful world to explore yep. I, uh, greece is also beautiful but they really went for those epic sunsets and it's amazing and mm-hmm. um, uh, it's not a criticism of the the the, the, the artist because the lighting in valhalla is stunning the weather is stunning the skies are stunning but there's just something a bit boring about england vinland is beautiful norway is beautiful but yeah england didn't really do it for me i'm afraid we, we <laughs> just, live just in from england. an exploring the map sort of point of view oh, we could yeah, testify <laughs> when i saw um a playthrough um i think uh, kate was going through it i think it was one of kate's streams uh with sasa um it, the the landscape reminded me of the witcher 3 oh. and i was like wow this is really great now i want to play the witcher 3 again <laughs> <laughs> now is that a historical game trial. i'm not sure <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> i'm sure you could learn something <laughs> How to play Gwent, oh, I think. I will. Well, if, if we're going to talk about Witcher, <laughs> we have to get our friend uh, White Wolf Whispers on the show if we're going to talk about the Witcher, because she is a massive uh, Witcher nerd. But that's that's a topic for another time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what are we talking about anymore? How did we get here? We're talking about the map. What we talking uh, about? Oh, right, oh yes, right, the right. map. The Too map. Big. That was it. I think I think the phrase is biomes, if you want to talk about, uh, mm. you know, um, how they, uh, they divide the world up to make every area look unique. Um I think... I've got a question for, for Amit and for Brianna. Oh, so are you seeing over time um, a trend where students are, are studying history or archaeology or ancient studies because they've been inspired by the games that they've played in their, in the, you know, in their teenage years or their, their younger years? Um, I haven't, uh, no one has said anything to me about it. I asked, I, I actually asked my Roman history students, <laughs> uh, if, <laughs> random Roman history students, um, if, uh, <laughs> surprise, <laughs> <laughs> if they've played the Assassin's Creed games and per, mo- most of them had. And, uh, so I don't know if, if they are just if they enjoy all of it at the same time or if one inspired the other i'm i'm not i'm not sure no one has actually said anything to me to me but maybe maybe kate uh, has that experience um i mean i teach slightly younger people uh so they're they're always up to date with you know all all sort of technology and everything else I think that like uh, games now are what the Mummy and Indiana Jones was for my generation, mm. uh, and I'm an old person gotcha. here. But <laughs> I think there, those are like the first um, interactions that some that some people have with uh, with history, because there are not many historical or archaeological movies. But then again, Uncharted is a series. Tomb Raider has been revamped. Now the Uncharted movie is coming out. Yeah. Um, so I do think that they might inspire people to, you know, uh, to start studying history and archaeology. The how is a whole other topic. Um, that's like the whole the whole issue with how archaeology is portrayed in these in these games. Mm. Uh, but for history, I think that most definitely they will help at least making people curious about that. And then maybe if you know, uh, young uh, young teenagers have have. Uh, some interest in for for history maybe they might decide to get into the humanities uh, because of the games i would not recommend that but maybe you know <laughs> <laughs> they would decide to get into that <laughs> good for them um but at I least think at doing... least fill the classes so we can have jobs oh yeah that's fair but i think like <laughs> these games so are doing these games are doing what the mummy did for us and what indiana jones did for us Right. And, um, do you know, I was listening to a, pod, a a different podcast. I think it was um, In Our Time, which is a BBC mm-hmm. radio for very long running um, sort of historical documentary um, radio show. 
I love and that show. I love it too because they cover the whole range of the sciences and the humanities, and Everything. it's it's brilliant. Everything. Um, yeah, they were doing an episode probably a year ago um, on it wasn't dinosaurs generally; it was a specific study of dinosaurs, and they had a panel of three archae- um, paleontologists on. And they all said, look, my story is very simple. Um, I watched Jurassic Park and I wanted to study dinosaurs. And it's, it's kind of an in, it's kind of an obvious joke in paleontology circles that people are just, you know, um, that's what inspired them. And, you know, if someone watches The Mummy and they're in, I have to say, everything I know about ancient Egypt comes from this game, or Origins, and The Mummy. So I'm pretty sure I've got perfect historical knowledge. <laughs> You can cover your ears at that point, Brianna. <laughs> but I love The Mummy. It's a great film. It's a great oh, action adventure too. film. <laughs> it is fantastic. I appreciate that. It was a uh, cons- uh, an Egyptologist actually consulted on it. Ah, really? Okay. Mm-hmm. So they weren't just completely making up as they went along. No, yeah. and that and that same Egyptologist is going to be in our last uh, DLC, Curse of the Pharaoh Street. Oh, fantastic. Oh, yeah. Yep. Fantastic. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Go on, Declan. You, you put your hand up, Declan. You wanted to say something. I was just listening and it makes me laugh that, you know, everything you are discussing is probably why I got into history. Indiana Jones, I wanted to be an archaeologist. I didn't know if, it, if I could find the Holy Grail or not, but I wanted to try. <laughs> uh, the Mummy, I wanted <laughs> to get into archaeology. Jurassic Park, I wanted to enter paleontologist. And this was all before I turned 11 yes. years old. <laughs> and then, absolutely, when I was 12, I wanted to get back into archaeology because of Assassin's Creed and... Now as an adult, I really want to get back into archaeology just because of Assassin's Creed. <laughs> but I like I like doing history of Assassin's Creed. But one history that I think we should explore more, and I'm probably gonna get told off for this, is it's like I don't know how to word it, but the mythology series has touched on about the mythology culture and history, you know, and how it's like shaped civilizations. Not much not many games tv shows touch on how mythology affects the culture and the historical times of the period like vikings and their gods and how they helped with the farming and everything and i really think we need to see more of that explained if that makes sense what do you mean like like how it's like if you look at um origins because i like origins origins fun they had an opportunity, and I see it in the discovery too, where they talk about how cats were worshipped. They could have mm-hmm. talked about the social side of history, so like how people helped irrigate the land, the desert. But a lot of times in the discovery too, they talk about like their belief systems in the pharaohs, building pyramids, the mummification. I really think Assassin's Creed should do more about how mythology affected cultures through history, if that makes sense. I'm probably rambling. <laughs> No, it does make sense. Um, yes. They tried that with Valhalla with um, some very high highs and some very low lows. The problem with mythology is Sorry, that, that just nice made me here. giggle. Sorry, I'm, I'm <laughs> carry nice on. Here. Um, the problem with mythology is that for at least for ancient Egypt, ooh, you need to choose which cities mythology you want to run with Mm. otherwise you are going to need to fill in a lot a lot of stuff uh and brianna knows way more than i do about this but like there are several creation myths for Mm. as many cities so if you ask the people in memphis they're going to tell you one version of it if you ask the people in heliopolis they're going to tell you another version of it and there is no like the the risk let me put it this way the risk of talking about ancient mythology is making it seem like the culture is a monolith when it's mm-hmm. very, very fragmentary. Correct me if I'm wrong, Brianna. No, you're absolutely correct. And and uh, yeah, Declan, you made a very good point about that. They kind of just took it for granted uh, that there are temples and apis bulls uh, without actually explaining uh, what an apis bull is. And you can learn all about that in the last stream. <laughs> or no, it was the Minevis bull. Anyway, um, but yeah, in in origins i hadn't noticed that because i already know the 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 facts uh of the um like you know all of the mythological stuff but yeah with someone who's playing it for the first time and or they're encountering egypt for the first time and they go to 
uh, the the temple of the Serapeon or sorry not Serapis. Um, they're it's not going to really make a difference to them. It's not going to really I, they're not going to really care about why that's there versus why there's a temple of Thoth in Hermopolis. I love to bring up Hermopolis <laughs> or why there's a temple of Ptah. Can, if, in can, if I can just interrupt Memphis. you there one moment yeah. and just say to everyone listening, your homework is to go and explore Hermopolis in Assassin's Creed. Oh, Set it on fire. Anyway, back to you, Brianna. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, I think you're absolutely right that they kind of um, didn't really go into that. Uh, maybe they didn't want to because it is complicated. Um, do they do anything with Discovery Tour? I haven't gone into Discovery Tour for Origins. That's just what um, I was wondering. <clears throat> there, is, there is some some on, some some content on religion um i think when it where it really shines is like day-to-day -day life but also because yeah. we have like you can show the objects and you can show the production method and everything else but i'll say this in, a, in an attempt to bring us back to topic uh, that <laughs> what, what are you saying <laughs> i think and for my experience the these like uh places where there are some there is some some information is lacking from the game is where you can use it as an educational tool because mm. then if like they plop the Serapeum in the middle of Alexandria and they just tell you, ah, Serapis, the Greek Egyptian god, then you can explain to students or to people why Serapis is important and why he looks like that and why he's got the module on his head and mm. all of that. And that is what um, several people that I know are teaching with, uh, with games, especially with, with Assassin's Creed Origins, but also Odyssey are doing you can show them things and then explain why they were um included in the game and why they are significant in this sense i think perhaps it's better to have less information because then we can fill the gaps so to speak i don't know if i'm making sense no you're making sense it mm -hmm. makes perfect sense yeah you know um i suppose there's there's an element of I'm, I'm, I'm trying to think of the counter argument, which would probably be Bayek was a devout, you know, native man. He understood the gods and the meaning. So it would be weird if all the characters did a load of exposition every time he reached a new temple and explained, well, this is actually a hybrid Greek Egyptian the god and this bull is sacred because of these reasons. So perhaps it it makes sense in what was the word phrase internally consistent because mm -hmm. Bayek doesn't need. The, the meaning or the importance of the Apis bull to be explained. I must admit, when I played it, it was important to uh, Pashrempta, so I assumed the bull was important, so I had to help, you know, work out why it was being poisoned. And it never, maybe I'm just not curious enough, but it never bothered me that I didn't know the backstory of, of why the Apis bull was important. I just knew that I needed to get get it sorted, you know? <laughs> right, they, they tell you enough. Like, the, even even Bayek is yeah. like very reverent towards this, this cow. Um, yeah. And, and, you know, uh, whereas we are we are shown that like the, uh, for example, the the Roman soldiers do not care about cats, and there's the whole subplot of them killing cats. <gasps> yes, how I dare they? Guy. I'm just going to say bloody Romans. <laughs> <laughs> My ancestors. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Wow. wow. Uh, I mean, allegedly, I don't believe that. But, <laughs> uh, but it is. I mean, no, it's true. Like, there's a lot too much exposition that would just make it uh, a a teaching moment that is like rammed True. down your throat when actually the good thing about games is that you can find things and learn about them in a sort of like while still enjoying the game which mm -hmm. is what i think they did really well in odyssey for example when you go to delphi and there's like the little um eye icons and you can check yes. the various offerings yes. like the craziest ones and they give you a little tidbit of history and then you can go and you know deepen that knowledge yourself if you want but it's not like paragraphs and paragraphs or explanation of what that is. Um, I thought that was really tastefully done. Yeah. Odyssey um, was the first game in the series I played. Origins was really? the second. Um, and I'm not an expert in history. I've read a few books and whatever. And um, seeing Delphi and all of the temples recreated. And I, again, I can't give the marks out of 10 for accuracy because I have no idea what it really looked like. I've seen, you know, the sort of the watercolor artist reconstructions but it just blew my mind to see this this incredible sort of center of hellenistic society if you like um brought back to life um and it was it was still demure in the game mm. 
they really mm. tone it down. Like all the temples and sanctuary, they're really, really empty by Greek standards. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I want to know why no one ever took the gold and all the treasure out of the temples. Maybe they were oh. just scared of. <laughs> they did. Several they did? times. Oh, oh no. yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. They did. <laughs> I'm not just talking about those pesky Persians, mine. I'm talking about, you know, just the ordinary people wandering around the city. <laughs> oh, no, the, the ordinary people uh, did not because uh, their economy depended on the temple. But then again, mm. uh, invaders, and I'm talking about the Romans, um, gladly oh, Romans. took and, and looted. And, you know, the 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 Celts, the Gauls that came down also looted the temple. Uh, mm. The other Greeks, the, like the neighbors, also looted the temples. Uh, you yeah. know, religious wars are always a good excuse to sack other people's sanctuaries. Mm. Um, mm. But the locals would be tied to the temple because if the temple fails, then your economy collapses. And okay. just like that, we are in <laughs> ancient economy. <laughs> Declan, I, I, I think... Um... You wanted to ask a question about, should we say, Egyptian clothing? <laughs> clothing. <laughs> See, this is, now, did this you just, because Amit came on the show about three or four, no, before I joined, maybe six months ago. And I believe this topic may have already come up, but I'm always happy to revisit it. It's a topic that I always want to revisit. And I know that kind of sounds weird because Assassin's Creed to me does a lot of explaining the history, the location, it's worth discovery to it, but it always fails to describe clothing. And I know clothing's not important, blah, blah, blah. But as a guy who, you know, spent 20% of my time on Origins Googling, I never once for a minute decided to Google the armor and the clothing because I just thought, you know, that's what they were. So when Amit was on the Origins Fact or Fiction and I learned bombshell that trousers may not actually be accurate i am <laughs> actually confused to this day still like i'm going to admit that i still think bath towel is the canon attire for the entire game <laughs> but, it should be <laughs> but it's just kind of got your question that should discovery tour a little bit discuss about the clothing because i'm actually curious about clothing now <laughs> uh brianna take it away oh, um <laughs> About the, the bath towel, or because <laughs> that us wasn't everything. A thing. Tell us about ancient Egyptian fashion. Oh, um, not my forte, but uh, yeah, they wore linen, um, pretty much. Uh, it was very plain. It wasn't as colorful as you might find in the game. Uh, and certainly, nobody except the king wore those those headscarf things, the nemes cloth. But this is something that's always in. Uh, mainstream media portraying Egyptian men with those um, headscarf things. <laughs> it's a favorite. Uh, you find it in cartoons and even in, I think, the Ten Commandments movie. Anyway. Um, so only, only pharaohs would have worn that kind of headscarf, you said. Yeah. I mean, you do see some oh, people yes. wearing head coverings when they're working because they want to keep things out of their head hair or off of their heads or something like that so there there is some art that shows people wearing headscarves um in the old kingdom i think we have this um but uh just i, I know the the, the keyword that we're looking for here is underwear um, we, do... <laughs> we never said that <laughs> how dare you i know i know garments you know this is what people are waiting for um, absolutely <laughs> we actually have um, uh, ancient Egyptian underwear uh, that has survived, and it was kind of just like a triangle of cloth that you tied, just like a you know a loin cloth kind of thing. Um, and uh, yeah, so we, we we have that. Um, no bath towels, however, this this wasn't a thing. Um, and the the Anubis guards in the afterlife actually uh, are wearing black uh, underwear. <laughs> We discovered the last stream. Yeah, yeah. Um, fortuitously, they, like, uh, they, they are wearing uh, black boxers because I yes. guess you need to cover yourself in the afterlife. I have questions. <laughs> I, don't, I don't think I'm going to like the answers, so I'm not going to ask the questions. Interesting. <laughs> yeah, I thought that was really uh, quite uh, hilarious. Um, Bayek isn't wearing any underwear under his towel. Um and uh, not that we see anything, but I just didn't see any <laughs> um, 
Uh-huh. Underwear is being this is this portrayed. is called science. Also, why would he wear underwear under a towel if the towel is what he wears at the baths, right? I may or may not have been curious to see <laughs> how much they decided to show under a towel. <laughs> this is this is all about the the accuracy of the yes, character model yes, and the art and you know absolutely. the the rendering. So, all right, so. Um, <laughs> it's false. <yeah. clears throat> what was the script? Let's return to the script. So it's it's uh, it's forty eight BCE, and we're in Alexandria, a, a the largest city in Egypt at the time, and a I guess a melting pot of different cultures and and so on. Would was there bathhouses of I suppose the ones we would think of in in Roman terms um, in Alexandria at the time? Oh gosh, uh, see, I usually stop caring about. <laughs> <laughs> Ancient <laughs> Egypt after the thirtieth dynasty. Uh... <laughs> Kate, you might know more than I uh, about uh, Ptolemaic period stuff. A, a, a little bit more. Uh, bathhouses. Some I'm not sure. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not entirely sure. Because mm. um, that's kind of the first big set piece. Well, there's there's Maduna Moon who we we kill um, in Siwa, but that's like the first big set piece assassination mission, isn't it? And we. We sort of fall down and land on the guy's head, don't we? And then we have to we, we slice him with our hidden blade. So there cuts are our off. Roman baths. Okay. I you don't know that, if you? they were. Of course, I did. Uh, <laughs> that, that, Danielle is going to kill me. Um, I we'll, don't we'll, know. Ed, we'll edit that line out, Amit, so that we didn't make it clear that you googled it. <laughs> I did. No, it's because um, I was actually doing the same thing. <laughs> yeah, see, there we go. Brilliant. Brilliant. Uh, listen, there's no shame in that. No, there were there were baths, uh, but mm. I don't know if they were built if they were built there. Um, I would assume that maybe not yet. Mostly because Egypt was not Roman yet; it had yeah, not been conquered. Point. It was still its own thing. Um, so Greek, uh, Greek stuff, yes. Greek gymnasium, absolutely. Uh, Roman baths, difficult if you're not a Roman province yet, huh? Yeah. 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 See, I sound smart now. <laughs> <laughs> but we'll allow um, it because it's a good assassination, and we we earn a bath towel as a result. It is an excellent assassination, uh, but also um, Bayek would not wear pants because he's not a Roman soldier. Roman legionaries, maybe. Um, cavalry, when, definitely. When you say pants, are we talking underwear <laughs> or trousers? Gonna... Yep, I got to ask. Trousers. Trousers. Let's talk. Let's talk trousers. Yeah, right. uh, underwear. I think most more common than not. Um, trousers. No, um, I don't think we have any representations of Egyptians of the time wearing trousers. Uh, Roman soldiers, yes, uh, but native Egyptians definitely not. Mm-hmm. Gotcha. So the Women men would have just worn like a short tunic then, or something like that, or a long tunic. It depends how uh, fancy okay. you want to be. Uh, okay. But not not much, uh, not much in the terms of in the ter- in, in terms of trousers. It also makes not it, it doesn't make a lot of sense. It's hot. You are mm-hmm. not riding a horse. Why would you wear trousers? Mm. Mm. <laughs> right. Mm. I wonder how I, they dealt I'm with making big rub. assumptions that's here. My, that's my wonder. Anyway, <laughs> um, I got one final fashion question because we spoke about this at length on Discord some time ago. Because I I had a discussion with with on, oh, right. on Twitter because um, I when when we first meet Bayek, he's heavily bearded. He's got long, long. I want to say dreadlocks. I don't know where they are or not. And when he's reunited with Aya, they have a bath under the city of Alexandria, and she shaves his head. She shaved his beard off, and he looks great, clean shaven. Um, and as a result of that, I kept him clean shaven throughout the rest of the game because I figured that's how I liked him to look and that's how I'd kind of role play his his Aww. look for the rest of the game. That's so cute. Um, oh, stop it. Um, <laughs> and But I, 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 I then had people saying to me, what? Bayek looks way better with a beard. So I, I messaged my, my uh, consultant Egyptologist and said, what would have been the kind of historically accurate for the time period hairstyle facial hairstyle for a man um in egypt and uh, amit take it away what what would bike have looked like if he was historically you know accurate well if we look at the fayum portraits and like or generally portraits from more or less the same time period there's a giant variety of beards no beards uh longish hair shortish hair 
all of that. As a rule, in more ancient times, and of course, Brianna, you can jump in and yell at me whenever, <laughs> uh, men would be clean-shaven. Yeah. Uh, maybe a little goatee if you have to. Or rehab. a mustache. Or a mustache, I was about to yeah. say. Like, we have these beautiful uh, ancient statues from the Old Kingdom uh, mm. of Prince Sarahotep, <laughs> who has the <laughs> most <Sorry>. dashing <laughs> mustache. Um, and we also have like um, a pharaoh, maybe with like a mustache. We're not really sure. Is that like just a crease? Is that a mustache? We don't know. We don't know. Um, but most uh, most men would be clean shaven. It's also more hygienic. Um, right. yeah. mm. Later on, we have these beautiful portraits of people that like some have like a full beard, some have like you know how do you call it the, the a shade of it. Um, some other have beautiful mustache. Some are like absolutely clean, and some also have their um, their hair shaven. I guess the big the answer is it depends. Um, well, I think uh, with the Fayum portraits, uh, we have to ask the question of are, were these Roman colonists because they were mm -hmm. wearing Roman clothing instead of mm -hmm. Egyptian clothing. You've got pearls, which they right. didn't wear. Um, but you also have Greek names and mm -hmm. people whose like whose names are written in Greek. So are those Romans? Are those Greeks? Who are those right. people? Right? Are those native Egyptians? So it also depends on on ethnicity, I guess. Yeah. Can we say yeah. ethnicity? <clears throat> I or think like, so. All right, that I is fair. So. Also, if you're a soldier or not, if you're a soldier and you're on campaign, you're go you you want to have everything like shaven and kept and short because you that's know, a good easier, point, right? We actually have there's an uh, a tomb painting of uh, a barber shaving the heads of uh, um, soldiers, even right. Oh wow! Right, right, right. Yeah. Wow. And we know and we know that priests had to be completely shaven, especially like yeah. the higher ups. Uh, yep. The first and second prophets, they would have to be completely shaven because they had to be absolutely pure in front of the gods. So not even eyebrows. When, when you say are, completely shaven, do you mean completely shaven? That's what we are told. Understood. Yeah. So, you know. <clears throat> we have a lot of uh, surviving razors and tweezers. So, yeah, they really went in. Oh, yeah. They, wow. they did. We have yeah. this these, these makeup and personal grooming sets. Fabulous. And the most fabulous mm -hmm. ones are high-ranking men. Yeah. Amazing. One thing I always remember, and you'll probably correct me if I'm wrong, just to jump across the Mediterranean was Julius Caesar was unusual because he plucked his facial hair, whereas the fashion at the time was for a big beard. Um but maybe I've misremembered that. But yeah, you know, we, we think of hair care as a modern thing with Jesus, electric razors. And yeah, well, that's what I, I want. And again, I might have misremembered that. But yeah, that was something that, that marked him as unusual. So if I got that wrong, feel free to, to you know, message me on Twitter and correct me. It's absolutely fine. <laughs> um, but we sort, we sort of think of hair care and, and, you know, going to the hairdressers and so on as a modern thing. But as you just said, Amit, it was, there was camp or Brianna, there, there were uh, soldiers were being maintained should we say by by <laughs> army barbers and people were taking very diligent care of their personal appearance um i think it's fascinating as a as a um as a tangent here one of my favorite things one of my favorite tidbits of information is that the pharaoh had uh manicurists mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah mm -hmm. it was a, it was an actual official position uh, and we have the tomb, it's a surviving tomb of his two manicurists, um, Knum Hotep and Niank Knum. Um, they have their is, names uh, recorded as well. Yeah, yeah. Oh, uh, Old Kingdom, Fifth Dynasty. Um, their, their tomb is uh, really interesting because it shows both men in it. Um, it shows they have wives, uh, but it has been suggested that maybe they were uh gay lovers who were buried together uh others suggest they are brothers i'm thinking that they're brothers because of the name knum in both of their names and because i have found that in families there's uh the the name of the personal god of the family like the the patron deity of a particular family the names would uh occur in the names of the, the the children so they would have similar names and then the name of the god knum is in the name of both of the men so i personally think that they're brothers um but we don't know especially i don't know maybe kate has uh, other opinions about that um i mean i've 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 heard all sort of opinions that, that they were brothers that they were conjoined twins that they were all sort of that all sort of things 
Um, I don't know, to be fair, I would like the explanation that maybe they were a couple um, <laughs> and that they had to, you know, had wives because that's what you do, uh, right. no matter your, your sexual orientation. Uh, right. But I, I don't know. And I mean, in, in no position to give <laughs> an informed opinion on the matter. Uh, but I do love that the title is uh, the manicurist of the king. Yes. Mm. And well, the other the, one is the, the right hairdresser. Hands. Yeah. Oh, well, they, 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 bo they both actually worked on his nails. One did the right hand, one did the left hand. They're amazing. They're amazing. <laughs> so that's why some people think maybe they are twins for that reason. Um, and in their tomb, I should also mention that they're shown putting their arms around each other and touching noses, which was uh, mm -hmm. considered a, like, a form of a kiss, you might say. Um, but yeah, it's it's a really cute tomb. It's very controversial for some people. They're like, oh my God, I can't believe that. Oh. <laughs> yeah, that, you know, okay, that okay, kind people of thing. didn't exist like, as well. <laughs> like, calm down. It's right. okay. It's fine. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But once again, like the manliest man in the whole land having manicurists. So... You know. Yeah, yeah, I just love that. I, I mean, if I was the pharaoh, that I bloody well have my nails looked after by someone. My nails look terrible. Oh at the yeah, moment. why not? <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, somebody had to trim them. You know, I mean, I, yeah. I, I, you know, I always just actually wondered how they trimmed the nails in antiquity. With files? Did they have scissors? They have files. files. Oh. Yeah, you can file your nails. And I mean, considering that in one in one very specific ceremony, you need to have a cow lick your hands. You you want you want everything to be. <laughs> I think I think we need it's to unpack a, it's that. It's ritual. Amit. It's ritual. It's a ritual. Okay, and you have to have a cow lick your it hands. It is a ritual. So in the, <laughs> in the sad festival, should should we like, should we explain uh, the in joke about rituals first? <laughs> oh, oh my god. Okay, several layers to this joke. Ha ha ha. Pun intended. Uh, when archaeologists. <laughs> don't know how to explain something we say it's ritual um gotcha. so that is the first layer the second layer is for after hours and we're not gonna tell it here. <laughs> no we, we save that for the yes the after hours we save podcast. that for the after sure. hours uh but in short in the sun festival which is um a festival that you're supposed to celebrate after your 30th year on the throne mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um one of the uh ceremonies that need to be performed is that a, ha um, a cow which is supposed to be the goddess hathor is supposed to show her favor to you pharaoh by uh licking your hand and how do you convince a cow to do that well uh we are told that the trick is you have some honey on your hand makes sense. so that the cow will actually come to you and you know show her favor to you by licking you maternally um, but you would want to clean your hands after that for reasons. You know, no offense to the cows. It's actually a cute thing. Uh, <laughs> I worked in Abydos, Egypt for uh, several uh, seasons and uh, we have a, a donkey and the, the director tends to feed it sugar after we have, uh, it brings our breakfast to us. Um, and so one time... Uh, sorry, I, I keep moving things on my desk, so it's making noises, and I keep forgetting that I shouldn't no, be doing that. Anyway, um, <laughs> uh, so one of the days I got to feed sugar to the donkey, and so the donkey was licking in between my fingers and all of these. It was so cute. So I'm just I, I'm, I'm imagining how that would have been for the set festival, and it must have been very cute. <laughs> wow. you, were, you were blessed. You. Oh, I was. <laughs> Did you call on your two manicurists immediately afterwards though, to clean up? That's, that seems yes, to be the right way did. to finish that ritual. I did, yes, absolutely. <laughs> how, how did we go from teaching to cows? Is it my fault? Probably. This is, this is cultural insight. This is great. <laughs> oh, are we not teaching? I we are absolutely teaching. Right teaching. Now. We are absolutely teaching. teaching things. <laughs> all right so I'll, I'll ask a question this is prompted by just for people listening so we when we're doing our recording we have the the audio tracks we also have like a, a chat that we can use if we need to communicate without disturbing other people speaking and um brianna you've put in the chat that your favorite is this your favorite quest or your favorite mission in origins was escorting the crocodile Oh, it's one of my favorite animal missions. Uh, okay. This was in uh, uh, when we were talking about the the mission of saving the the cats or, or mm -hmm. saving the guy who was saving the cats. Um, right. But there's a really great mission, uh, a quest that I hadn't expected to encounter. But you have to <laughs> save this crocodile. 
from Romans and a whole team, like two, two, two times, I think you have to kill a bunch of Romans, maybe two or three times. And then you have to escort this gigantic crocodile to safety. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Is this like down in so Crocodilopolis, big. if I remember rightly? No, this was up, uh, up further north. I think it was near... Uh, okay. I can't remember where it was. Uh, it was it was in the Delta area. Oh, gotcha. Uh, okay. But the one yeah, the one in Crocodilopolis is the one that has the eye issue that you have to solve. Oh yeah, okay. yeah. So you have to, the giant a white one covered in jewels, the bedazzled one. That's the one in Crocodilopolis. <laughs> okay. Oh, okay. Okay. Gotcha. So this one is up in the Nile. Understood. So yeah, what what was it about that mission? Was it just that it made you laugh, or was it? Yeah, I thought it was just so absurd escorting a crocodile <laughs> when you and then like you're crossing a, a a space where there's other antagonistic crocodiles and so you're killing cro crocodiles while escorting another one and it's like what <laughs> what is this? <laughs> it was funny. I, I thought it was mm. hilarious and uh, mm. you know it gave me some XP, which I was that was the time when I was trying to level up. So I was like, all right, gotcha. let's go escort a crocodile. Well, why not? <laughs> what about you, Amit? What was your favorite mission, side mission, main story quest for, for in Origins? Do you have oh a favorite? Oh, I I have many favorites. I've been I've been replaying it lately. Uh, oh God, um, I don't know. I don't know. I remember. So the one that made me the most excited when I first played it was when you have to drive a chariot in the hippodrome. Oh, I feel I terribly. Yelled they are so on hard to drive. <laughs> it's hard, but like you need to understand. As a child, I watched Ben Hoare the movie, <laughs> and I was like, I can drive a chariot in a Roman <laughs> hippodrome. Just give me the thing. I'm gonna kill everyone. <laughs> this is fantastic. See, this is, this like... is bringing history to life. It's great. Exactly. My whole <laughs> life has you know has has come to the uh, has brought me to this point. But it's true because it's one of the few times where you can actually understand how difficult and dangerous it is to drive a fucking chariot. Mm. Yeah. And why people yeah. died on the road. Well, not on the regular, but let's say like chariot driving is a difficult thing because what you see in movies like very smooth, very, you know, like it's it's basically they're driving a Ferrari, but actually it's difficult. <laughs> and if anything breaks, you're dead. Like if your chariot breaks, you're dead. Like a wheel breaks, well, goodbye. Like the uh, the <laughs> yoke gets, you know, breaks and is disconnected, you're also dead because the horses are going to keep going and you're going to go backwards or forward and, you know, plant your face on whatever it is at, a, <laughs> at high speed. Turning, like doing a 180 in the hippodrome, good luck with that. So <laughs> in that sense, it can teach us something about, you know, um, safety measures in the ancient world. <laughs> <laughs> safety I, they, they, I suppose they were kind of the formula one drivers of their time weren't they absolutely um, in terms of the speed the risk mm -hmm. the reward i'm assuming the yeah. rewards were, were good as well if if you can yeah also the the good thing is um egyptian chariots are very light there is one there's a reproduction of one in the egyptian museum in florence mm. and it is smaller and lighter than you would expect and i assume that you would need to find because it's two people on chariot right there's one who drives and one, especially if it's a war chariot, one mm -hmm. who drives and one who shoots arrows or, you know, whatever they have. Yeah. You need to find two people of comparable weight. Otherwise, mm. it's not going to go well. So I'm always imagined like the lines of people just trying to figure out who is the right size to be their, you know, their charioteer and who's the right size to be, to be the warrior. But uh, it's, that's, that was a really cool thing that, that really brought history to life for me. Because never ever i could have imagined that i would have been driving a, a chariot i was like ah oh, this is amazing this is fantastic <laughs> i was very excited i still am although i hate that mission but it was so cool <laughs> I, I did enough chariot driving to earn the achievement i can't remember the achievement off the top of my head but i, I just <laughs> found it so challenging although my competitive nature i kind of wanted to get to the top of the leaderboards or whatever i did enough to get the achievement and then i moved yeah, on I but bet. I love the fact that you loved it so much. <laughs> Beckley, yeah, can you, you really remember your... To... Sorry, Brianna, sorry. go on. I, I just want to... Just going off of what Kate was saying about chariots uh, driving in reality, it just makes you really appreciate the organization of the military in antiquity. Mm -hmm. I mean, it they this this took effort. And mm -hmm. uh, I think... I, I don't think a lot of people really give a lot of credit to how much effort is put into military organization. They just assume, I mean, talking about um, just 
mainstream people they just assumed that everything was just oh you just run at the the two fronts just run at each other and slice oh and my. dice but oh, don't eat it's them. uh even in ancient i mean we i think we all can say this about the phalanx in greek uh in greece and all of these yeah. things but with yeah. egypt they also had just really organized military uh and I just thought, I, I, Kate just made me think of that. So that's why I said that. So sorry, you were asking Declan about Well, no, I'll tell you what, let's, Declan, we'll come back to you. Let's take a little, another segue. So yeah, we think of, of classical Greece with, with the phalanx. We think like Macedonians kind of adapted that with a huge, even longer pikes and so on. What, what was your Egyptian, what was the centerpiece of the Egyptian army, of the Pharaoh's army? Was it swords? Was it spears? Was it uh, archers or a mix of everything? Yeah, it was a mix of everything. There were specialists for sure. Uh, for archery, they uh, had Nubian mercenaries. Um, mm -hmm. They were very mm -hmm. excellent with uh, with bow skills, and so they would have uh, a whole. They would have whole factions of, of Nubian archers. Um, there are little models of Egyptian soldiers. Uh, they are carrying full body shields made of leather and uh, animal skins, and then they carry spears. Um, but of course, also they were skilled in the bow. The pharaoh was probably skilled in a bow, which is why we see this on the in the artwork a lot. <clears throat> I mean, he would have had to have been a military man also. I mean, Ramesses anyway, and Amenhotep II. Oh, is yeah. Famous for his bow skills. Oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> oh, right. Yeah, and and of course the the chariot drivers um, mm -hmm. and people who could throw spears and shoot arrows from these they had to be specialists as well. Yeah. You have people mm -hmm. who do ride horses, uh, uh, not just on a chariot, but actually ride the horses. Uh, and yeah, of course they did have sh uh, swords as well. Sorry, Kate. <laughs> yeah, no, 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 I was, I was, I was thinking like they also had like the uh, the heavy-ish infantry. It was act uh, people with axes. Mm. Uh, and shields and so and short swords if the situation is dire um but the uh two things i wanted to say about chariots wow how did we get to chariots this is amazing um one thing <laughs> is, we've gone off topic but it doesn't matter it's all good I stuff love that. This is, <laughs> is be it connected origin, to egypt we can talk about it <laughs> yeah no, so charioteers um would be the elite um mm. peasants pageantry they would not be charioteers um, and most of the high, uh, high officials like I, who became Pharaoh, were um, uh, um, like uh, commanders of the chariots mm -hmm. because you need to be able to afford it and you need to be able to basically do nothing all day, mm -hmm. uh, but train for that. So it's like it's an elite corpse, but it's also uh, rich people. And the second thing is that the way, this is a big pet peeve, the way in which chariot warfare is represented not only in games, but especially in movies, is all wrong. You don't ram the enemy with chariots. They break. And the, mm. the horses are not going to run into like a line of enemies with their spears up. They're, they're just not going to do it. You just use, the, <laughs> you use the, the chariots to just go around it and yeet shit at them. Um, <laughs> so, and, the other, and the other side of that, which we did not get in Odyssey and thank the gods we did not, is that uh, ancient Greek warfare, when you have a phalanx, is boring. Because it's you boring. just push yeah. and push yeah. and push and push and, you know, yell insults. And you hope that the enemy line will break, at which point you can just, you know, pull out your sword and start hacking left and right. But most of it is just pushing and pushing and pushing. And it's it doesn't make for a, a no. great... Um, no. game experience let's put it this I've, way. I've heard that argument a lot uh from from as a criticism of odyssey you know the the conquest battles are not historically mm -hmm. representative yeah for exactly what you said amit if you want to go and practice phalanx warfare go and play rome total war and whoever's got yeah. the longest line will probably turn the, fl the flank and win it's yeah it's a very different you know to, to what's actually fun to play um you know on your console or whatever yeah, no, exactly. But I think that some of the uh, of the total, like the Total War series, has a really good use of the Egyptian chariotry, which was mm. very, I was very pleased to see. Uh, I ha in Rome too, you can play with the Ptolemies, uh, and I was like, yes, this is this is my kind of army. This is my kind <laughs> of chariotry. This is what I need. Um, you have heavy chariots, like the Assyrians had, like these giant big mm -hmm. chariots that could probably. Um, you know, ran over people, and we know that um, some 
I don't, I don't know how to say it in English. They had like chariots with sights on the side. So you just, if you, if you are hit by that, you just, they just chop you yeah. um, into pieces. Yeah. Uh, but then again, they're not really effective. Like the most outlandish things in battle are generally not really effective, like elephants. Mm-hmm. Uh, not really. I mean, you just open and you let them go. So <laughs> yeah. Anyways, uh, this is, this is me having opinions, but Total War does that right. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Total War is good for that kind of simulator if you want to do phalanx warfare. Mm-hmm. Declan, I asked Amit and, and Brianna earlier before our, our segue, um, what was their favorite kind of mission or sequence or whatever in Origins? Can you? It's been a while since you played Origins, but can you remember your favorite? I can actually, and it's been a while and there's a lot embedded in my brain because I don't 100% it, but it's not a mission. And it's not a story, it's actually a trophy that I had to get. And it was the bring a crocodile on a date with a uh, bring a lion on a date with a crocodile. <laughs> that yes. was so yeah. difficult. You had yeah. to like you have to pet like make a lion a pet and then walk over a tro- crocodile to introduce them and then mm-hmm. start fighting and you get a trophy. It's yeah. stupid, it makes no sense. But it's absolutely difficult. Do you know how hard it is to make a lion a pet and take it's it to a crocodile? Hard, yes. <laughs> but it's funny as hell, especially since the first time I did it, my cro- my lion got beat up by a hippo. Oh no! Which I didn't realize how aggressive <laughs> are bloody hippos. I thought they were Once docile again, things. Something that they got very right yes. in the game. Hippos are the devil. Hippos are very they're aggressive scary <laughs> they're scary they will hunt you they will flatten you they're absolutely vegetarian they're not gonna eat you they're just gonna kill you you know for the lols <laughs> i i literally played origins and my first google was did they screw up the ai for hippos because i just thought this was a gameplay mechanic and when i watched real life clips of be careful a hippo will bite your leg off not because it's hungry because YOLO, I was like, <laughs> okay, <laughs> I hate origins for hippos. Like, yeah. if, a, if a hippo bite, bit an, a man's leg off on safari because the man stood in the, the wrong place at the wrong time, it's like, how evil are these things? Like, they're tall. They look mm-hmm. slow. Why are they vicious? They're what? fast. They're fast. Yes. No, they're, they're killing machines. That's why Egyptians were scared of them. Mm-hmm. I'm scared of them. <laughs> you should be. <laughs> I hit every mission where Bayek was like, let's cross the Nile. I'm like, uh, is it crocodiles? I can deal with them. Is it hippos? Yeah, I'm going to find another route. I'm not dealing with fucking hippos again. I hate them. It's, yeah. In, uh, in tomb arts, you will often find people spearing hippos. Um, and then there is a story about the god Seth uh, when he's fighting Osiris, they <laughs> they have this uh, this um, competition for a boat race, and Horus tells Seth, "Okay, you have to. Are, the rules are to make a boat out of stone." And so Seth, he's very honest. Actually, we can we can come for once. On this. Yes, and so he's over there creating his stone boat, and he's very satisfied with his work. And Horus is over in the other side making a boat out of wood but he's painting it to look like stone so then they oh they, genius uh, so yes. <laughs> <laughs> he's very naughty uh and so then they they board their boats and they set sail and naturally seth uh seth sinks so he gets really mad at horace and he turns into a hippo to uh to attack horace <laughs> And then on the Edfu Temple, there is a representation of this on the exterior wall. <laughs> if Seth is a hippo, it's really funny. I love it. Even gods don't like hippos. That yeah. <laughs> literally, what what level of it's like spiders? People think are like spawn of Satan, but no, it's hippos. <laughs> literally hippos are feared by gods themselves gods don't care about spiders but you put gods in a room with hippos they're like nah screw it where's the spiders very Why? true they're not they're not as afraid of scorpions as they are of hippos as they should be and yet scorpions are more poisonous than a hippo a hippo will flatten you yes deadly but you a can s- outrun a scorpio you cannot outrun a hippo <laughs> you can squish a scorpion with a newspaper you hit a hippo with a newspaper, 
you sign in your mm. death certificate. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> I really want to go play oranges now. Mm -hmm. I want to play oranges now just to annoy hippos. <laughs> you should do it, yeah. I like uh yeah, I like finding hippo um nests so I can kill them all. I enjoy killing hippos. <laughs> you heard it here. <laughs> Uh, Once again, a this very, is recorded a very, for posterity. Yep. A very <laughs> elite activity in ancient Egypt. Hunting hippos fact, for sports, yes, hunting actually. lions for sports, uh, and crocodiles if you have to. If you well, must. I wonder if Dark Souls will ever make a hippo boss. And then just they make should. Boss. <laughs> just a big, giant hippo that will never go down. <laughs> Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I wonder. So, have you guys played? And this is off tangent. Origins on nightmare mode. Does that make like the yes. animal AI harder? Yes. If hippos are nightmare on easy, I would mm -hmm. hate to see a hippos on nightmare level. They I... are absolutely unhinged. <laughs> they hate you even more. <laughs> they come for you. They come for your family. They hunt your dreams. <laughs> They're bad. They're bad. He took a John Wick for a hippo. Was it Liam Neeson's <laughs> taken? I will find you and I will squish you. Yes. Yes. <laughs> oh currently, having an, currently laughing so much I feel I'm going to cough everywhere. <laughs> as long as you can mute yourself, eh? <laughs> I'll tell you what, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to um, jump forward a bit. So... Mm -hmm. um, at the moment, I think you're three streams or maybe, f yeah, maybe three into the um, Curse of the Pharaohs DLC. Now, of course, we're going a little bit, um, what would you say, Declan? Is it a bit more myth, this this part of, of the origin story? And, and you've been commentating on, oh, we, we spoke earlier, we, we discussed earlier your reaction to seeing the recreation of Armana um, in one of the afterlives. But how, how are you finding that part of the game? Is there... Is there some useful teaching in there? Or should we just say, no, this is all just a bit silly, but it's fun. So, you know, we'll, we'll play it anyway. Yeah, there's there's some good teaching in there. Um, I wish that they would have actually uh, more authentic art on the um, on the buildings in the Amarna afterlife. <laughs> what I'm calling it. Um like we were we were obsessing over this one architectural feature, the bridge, um, and this linked the ceremonial palace with the um, the king's palace. And there is some really interesting art that is featured on this. Oh, that's right. The other day I was thinking um, another architectural feature that was really a big deal in the Amarna period is the window of appearance, uh, and I didn't see this in. The architecture that um, that we encountered in the afterlife, and I don't know, Kate, you you've looked at this uh, this longer than I have. Did you find any window of appearances? Uh, not that I can recall. Perhaps mm -hmm. you should explain what a window of, ex of yeah. appearances is. Well, so, I just took a leaf out of your your two's books, and I was just quickly googling window of appearance while you were talking. <laughs> so carry on. Yes. yes uh, so the window of appearance is this. Uh, area where um, Akhenaten would, and he would be joined with his family, of course, he would um, be throwing, from this window, he would throw gifts down to um, high-ranking officials. Mm. Uh, and so there's some different types of depictions of what a window looks like. Sometimes it seems like it is maybe in the second story of a, of a palace. Uh, other times it may be a a kind of just a raised platform, um, but it was more. It was just kind of like a kiosk where he would hang out and then throw necklaces at people. <laughs> right, kiosk sounds less glamorous than window of appearance. <laughs> yes, but this was uh, something that was. It did occur in architecture before his reign. I believe there's one during the reign of Hatshepsut that occurs somewhere. Um, <laughs> I could have that wrong. Um, 
but yeah, there there are various types. Uh, the tomb, of, sorry, the temple of Rameses the Third in uh, what is modern day Luxor in the West Bank has a window of appearance, for example. Um, so I mean, this is kind of like you know, like when the when the Queen of England decides to show herself to her people from the balcony. Am That's I just what I was thinking. That? Is it yeah, like a balcony that. that the monarch yes. or the Pope would stand in um, in in the Vatican and deliver his yes. uh, Easter yeah. day and whatever? Is it that kind of exactly? Thing? Yes. Right. So now you should just think of uh, <laughs> the Queen chucking the <laughs> golden necklaces at people. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, I'll take it. I'll take it. <laughs> oh, and congratulations to her for her, uh, what is it, her diamond jubilee? It is, oh, geez, we should know Platinum, this. Platinum, Platinum jubilee. Platinum, 70. Platinum, 70 years, yeah. yes. More yes. than Ramesses II. Yeah, congratulations to her. Yeah. Well, congratulations she... for beating Ramesses. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> How did he live so long? Was he? Did he become Pharaoh as a very young boy? He was, what, uh, he was like 25 or something. Yeah. He, he just had a long life. He was so uh, long. Hang on, uncomfortable do the at the end. He was nearly 100 years old when he died. Mm -hmm. I think yeah. it was one, yeah, 92 or something like In that. His, yeah, wow. his, uh, he was very uncomfortable. He had arteriosclerosis and like a curved back and like probably ba and bad teeth and like various issues, um, health-related yeah. issues. But, you know, uh, so he may have been very uncomfortable for the last, let's mm -hmm. say, the last decade of his life, uh, if not more. But he was old. Rumor has it that King Pepe the Second reigned for eighty six years. Right, right, yeah. and he did uh, ascend the throne when he was a baby. We have these beautiful yes. statuettes of him on his <laughs> wet nurse's lap, and he's he's baby, he's a child, but he yeah. looks like a like an adult, but like miniature. Yes, yes. Uncness Mary Ray the mm Second. -hmm. That's his mama, actually. Oh, it's his mom. Yeah. Oh, that is even cuter. <laughs> <laughs> See, I went, I went high status. Oh, he's wet nurse. <laughs> Actually, it's his just nanny. his mum. Yeah. Yeah, it's yeah. just his mum. Oh, that's, that's even nicer. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I want to ask you sort of a final closing question, should we say. Um, actually, so, Amit, you've played all of the three the recent games that have the separate discovery tours. Um, Brianna, yes. have you only played Origins of the three recent Assassin's Creed games? Yes. Uh, I opened up Odyssey just for my class uh, last year when I was introducing them to Greek art. So I haven't wow. gotten to that yet. Um, and uh, yeah, so it's only been Origins that I've played. Uh, I've played the main quest and now I'm playing the one of the DLCs. I haven't played the Hidden Ones mm. DLC yet. Okay, understood. I was I was going to ask a cheeky question and ask for marks out of ten for the three games, or maybe a maybe a relative mm -hmm. ranking. I know that Vikings and and Greece is not your area of expertise, Amit, but that so that seems like an unfair question. Um, <laughs> so let me let me ask this the question this way. So we we have to balance the needs of it's a game mm -hmm. um, versus historical accuracy uh, versus making it immersive and fun. Um, versus budget there's always a budget limit to to mm -hmm. these games so if you were what what would you like to see maybe in future games um that are historically inspired or historically set um that would you know perhaps more suit what you're looking for in terms of that historical setting um i mean i don't know if this is a a good answer to your question, but I would love to see a game, an Assassin's Creed game, if they're going to go into that level of detail. Uh, I really want something from Mesopotamia. Right, gotcha. Oh yes, oh yes. And I can't, I can't de decide which uh, Assyrians. Maybe the Assyrians might be really fun um, mm -hmm. uh, with Nimrod, uh, yeah. the city it, it Nimrod. Also it would also be like a departure from just seeing, always seeing Babylon with the hanging gardens. Give us something yes, more. Yes. Give yes. us Nineveh. Give it's, us yes, know, yes, yes. The reign of Sargon. Structures. Yes, give us Sargon. Oh my God. Give us all these great kings. <laughs> I mean, there's so much in, in Mesopotamia because it's not just one civilization. You've got the Assyrians, the Babylonians, the, the Mitannians. Well, the, I, uh, I miss the, the Babylonians. <laughs> 
you were going there. I, I, I could hear. <laughs> you I could sense, sense it with you had your yes. spidey senses. <laughs> yes, I, 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 for, I foresaw. <laughs> but it's so cool because there are moments when the Hittites come down and attack people, and the, and then the the Assyrians absorb this this uh, civilization, and that one just disappears off the map altogether, and then they're fighting with this group over here. It, it's just it, there's so much to work with with Mesopotamia mm -hmm. and I really hope that this becomes the new interest, the new trend. We've got oh, sure. so much with Greece and Egypt and Rome. Mm -hmm. And I just we really we should really go more eastward. I mean, I don't think there's yeah. been a lot done with uh with China or uh or Japan or India, right? I might, uh, or had other games. Not triple A's. Not true. No, movies. not within this franchise. I mean, in, in the Assassin's Creed franchise, there are two much smaller games, one set in India, one set in China, but they're mm. totally different in terms of their format and how you play them to what you're you're used to with Origins. So no, I mean, Ubisoft has not tackled those. I mean, let's be honest, Assassin's Creed is a European, Mediterranean, and then yeah. it's North America, Caribbean, mm. and that's it, you know. Um so, yeah. I just had this uh, this glorious image in my mind of the terracotta warrior army <gasps> coming to life and, and <laughs> you have to defeat them or something. I don't know. How freaking cool would that be to see that? That would be great. And like something in Mesopotamia would also erase the uh, the main image that pops up in people's mind lately when you talk about, you know, Mesopotamia and Babylon and everything else, which is sand like sand and like nothing and like two two rivers and nothing else and like the american <laughs> troops walking in right mm -hmm. um <laughs> or like or just Ooh, or, you went there. <laughs> yeah or or antiquities being bulldozed down by other entities right, right. like there are yeah. just yeah. as like there are civilizations that are just as ancient and just as fabulous as egypt and greece and rome and like even more ancient than greece and rome so I think it would it, it's high time to do that. And it would be very interesting to see these cities recreated, especially if you're doing different civilizations, different architectural styles, yeah. different gods. Oh, my Completely God. Completely different. I just had this really great quest idea about a Lamasu. <laughs> so oh there are these God. guardians at these gateways. They're called Lamasu, and they can be lions or bulls with human heads. And so there's... Uh, if they there's... Got, are they human heads with wings? Is that right? Yes. Yeah. Yes. And um, they have these little scripts on there um, that keep them pinned to the wall so that they don't get up and walk around. How cool would it be to have a quest where you have to go hunt down the, you have to go find the Lamasu and, and bring him, because they're friendly, <laughs> just, they're happy guys. You have to escort them back to the walking. wall and just be like, hey man, you gotta, you gotta go back home. Yeah, just just please please come back like How you and your, all of your five legs come back yes <laughs> would that not be like the most glorious thing it's like the crocodile <laughs> escorting the it crocodile is. escort the lamasu yeah. you can even ride it oh man how oh man i want to ride a lamasu now it would but be you know, it would i think be fun. games give us this freedom where we can something that wouldn't work in television or film mm -hmm. can work in a video game because we can explain it as it's the animus or it's science fiction exactly. or it's it's the mushroom tea or whatever, <laughs> you know. Uh okay, so um, I've got one final question for you both. Um, and then I think we'll, we'll wrap up the show because we've been chatting about history and teaching for, for a while. Um, so could you tell me what what's your what time period or what geographical location would you love to visit? in one of these games for me it's definitely uh mesopotamia and there's there's a lot to choose from in mesopotamia uh and i mean uh, some of my favorites would be the assyrians uh, 600 bc ish um i think that would that would be just tops uh, i mean there's there's so much architecture there's so much um myth to explore and it would just look stunning i saw um on twitter a long time ago maybe a year ago i guess it was a 3d model recreation of a i guess it was a babylonian city and it was lots of fairly low one or two story buildings but when i saw that for for the sort of the parkour element of these games hmm. that would be a parkour dream running over those rooftops 
um, mm. and exploring those cities would be incredible. It would be great. And also since there are like so many different uh, cultures in the Mesopotamian area, like in history, you could really have like a variety of architectural styles and, you know, gods and religions and war like warfare techniques and clothes and weapons and art and, you know, you name it, we have it. Um, so it would be, it would be fabulous. And also like moving past just only ever showing Babylon and the hanging gardens. We love the mm. gardens, no offense to the gardens, but there's so much more than that mm. to show. Um, and it would also be probably interesting in terms of um, 3D reconstruction of buildings, since some of the things that were there have been bulldozed down mm. in recent years, unfortunately. So that's also one way in which, weirdly enough, a game could help archaeology and conservation and the other way around. Yeah. Yeah, that's interesting. So try and try and preserve digitally what has been mm -hmm. destroyed physically. Mm -hmm. Would you? Yeah, that would, would you be pick a really that? great for a Sorry, discovery Brianna. tour. Yes, that would yeah, be a really be, yeah. excellent. <clears throat> yeah, absolutely. For you, Amit, would you say the same region, the the Middle Eastern region, Mesopotamia, uh, or somewhere if, else? If we're oh, that is that's such a difficult question. Um, Mesoamerica. Yeah, I, I was about to say if I trusted. Uh, the studios to make a good job with it i think <laughs> right for for obvious reasons i think anything non-white non-european non-mediterranean i will be game because i know absolutely nothing about those things and i would love to learn like gotcha. absolutely oh, uh, but it would it would have to be really well done and they would have to consult with like local archaeologists who know what they're doing yeah, yeah. rather than you know keeping taking experts there are still white europeans <laughs> right yeah I, I think so I otherwise think so. you get you get really um good. the the eternals issue in which they show us tenochtitlan that has like 500 pyramids when there's were you know there was one so <laughs> that was hilarious <laughs> like, that part of the film yeah i mean that right. oh, i haven't seen crazy. it right i haven't seen it i kind of don't want to i just know i'm just not going to be happy uh, about it they uh, uh, they talk they talk in sign language to ancient Babylonians, but the sign for time is a wrist. So <laughs> I'm sure you see the problem. What? <laughs> Are yes. you kidding me? No, I'm not. Oh my gosh, wow. it's a problem. I mean, yeah. props, props to them for for using well, know, I a believe sign language. The, but, uh, uh, the uh, actress uh, herself is uh, is deaf. I thought. Yeah, 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 yeah. So maybe yeah, they're using like modern sign language also mm -hmm. perhaps to communicate with her specifically yeah. i don't know that's that's yes. the yes it just it just struck me as as weird that <laughs> is really have, bizarre they could have used another sentence <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness that's so funny but yeah you know we're bringing up uh mesoamerica oh my gosh just i'm um, because I'm, I'm picturing um the just the art of the movie apocalypto and oh. Oh. Just, I mean, I'm not saying that that was accurate at all, but the uh, like the the events or whatever, but just the the colors and the mm -hmm. the the clothes that they were like. Can you imagine that being in a game? I, I mean, how amazing, how amazing, and all of that that jade everywhere and just bright colored paint and the yeah the pyramids and climbing to the top of them. I God, that would be really fantastic. Oh yeah, well, like for any ancient civilization, like I think that uh, games are doing a really good job in showing us the ancient colors, and mm. sometimes they're still more demure than reality, yeah. um, because we know that antiquity was garish. Um, yes. But I think that that's that's a good thing. And there were there was some pushback of like some people complaining. They're like, oh, but the temples have too many colors. So like, well, guess what? They have they had even more. Uh -oh. It's just <laughs> <you know>. yes, <laughs> <laughs> they've been washed out. <laughs> so you know and statues were all painted and everything else so and you so know i think that. with the uh, games set in egypt and greece and rome i don't know if it's because they've uh people have played them enough um already or if it's just that this is something that they already have um perceptions like um they they already know things going into the games but when you have a game about the mesoamericans or, or mesopotamians that's going to be a completely different territory for a lot of people mm -hmm. uh you know they go yeah. into egypt having these preconceptions about what pyramids are 
and some I mean sometimes their pre conceptions are completely wrong and terrible um <laughs> but I think for Mesopotamia it's just largely unknown uh and I think it would be such a great opportunity to present a culture that people really don't know much about. Mm -hmm. Can you yeah. imagine seeing the blue of the Ishtar gate? Oh man. Oh, I, I would faint. I would yes. faint. Oh, or scream or both. <laughs> but it, it would be fantastic. And and I mean once again this the like saying like for for ancient for ancient civilizations it's also like very uh dependent on where the players are from because i'm sure that like players from uh from from mesoamerica know much more about their ancestors oh, than you know of than course. we do but it would be it would be really cool for like many people who are like in europe who don't know right. anything about that uh, and i mean but it it would have to be done it would have to be done properly that's that's my big that's my big fear yes. with with games and everything else because then you get games like which was the terrible one about egypt that you were playing and ranting about i don't like pharaonic <laughs> i played half an hour and then i was like i can't i can't handle like, this I anymore can't, i can't do it this is like orientalism is is alive and well and it's wrong uh so there's always there's always that risk of like making cultures and civilizations into stereotypes even if you're trying but then again giving yourself an air of oh kind of historical accuracy I'm like mm -mm 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 -mm. that's not it so it's a fine balance uh, mm -hmm. also i mean i'm i'm very white and very european so i'm i'm no authority on anything but <laughs> my <own thing>. <laughs> <laughs> but i would like to learn mm, yeah yeah all right, very good. Thank you both very much. I think we'll we'll wrap up the conversation there. It's been a really great um, chat about. Um, we talked a lot about origins, of course, because that's your area of of expertise. But also, just generally, you know, using games as a teaching tool. What games mm. you've enjoyed. Um, so I tell you what, let's let's wrap this up with with self promotion. So Amit, where can we find you on social media? Where can we find Save Ancient Studies? Uh, well, you can find Save Ancient Studies at anything Save Ancient Studies. Uh, we are on Twitch, we are on Twitter, we are on Instagram, we are on Facebook. And we stream every Friday at 2 p.m. Uh, we actually have a Mesoamerican game coming up on February 16th. We will interview the creators of Dream of Darkness, which mm, is a game nice. uh, that deals with uh, the um, what is known as the Aztec Empire. And then on the 22nd, we will actually have a special episode on the crossover uh, from Assassin's Creed or Odyssey um, with the host of Let's Talk About Myths Baby podcast. So those are our next things. And then every Friday for the whole of February at 2 p.m. S, um, we are doing uh, Curse of the Pharaohs with Brianna. And yes. what else? Oh, myself. Yeah. I mean, you can find me at, at <laughs> Amit underscore. That's A-M-M-I-T underscore. Uh, the name is the name of the Egyptian demon, the eater of souls, <laughs> on uh, Twitter and uh, uh, Instagram and on Twitch. I usually stream under Sasa. And yeah, that is, that is where I am. Or on, you know, <laughs> UBC, if you're interested in my scholarly work. <laughs> but I don't go by Amit at UBC, I have to say. <laughs> one day and and what about you brianna where can we find you if we want to follow your work and your gaming sure um the the main place that you can go is my youtube channel which is dr brianna jackson uh and i don't just do gaming but i also have informational videos on ancient egypt um and i also have a website which is brianna jackson Bri brianna jack brianna c jackson .com. <laughs> check <laughs> i just it's fine. I, it's fine. Just, yeah, yeah. We'll uh, figure it out. normally just uh <laughs> yeah it's brianna c jackson okay dot com uh and then i am on twitter which is at baladria b-a-l-a-d-r-i-a and instagram is the real baladria uh so the underscore real underscore baladria very nice what is a baladria <laughs> Maybe I shouldn't ask, actually. Um, I probably should have checked in advance before asking that. <laughs> no, it's, it's a character that I invented because I used to write stories. And in uh, when I was a kid, when I was 13, I created this story. And that was 
the main character, one of the main characters of the story that I created, and I really liked the name, so I applied it to myself, and I've been Baladria for 22 years now. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. I love that. Yes. That's great. That's absolutely great. All right, well, thank you both very much for joining us. Uh, Amit, who is also known uh, more properly as Kate, but we'll always call her Amit. Uh, Brianna, <laughs> thank you so much for joining us for the first time as well. It's been fantastic to have you both um on the show and to have a new guest on the show is is brilliant as well um if you're listening and you want to follow um declan and i declan's had to step away uh, towards the end of the recording so declan normally does his super slick closure of the show i'm doing it tonight and i'm winging it so you can follow us on twitter um, declan is at ac let's talk i am at james tiddly grid we're always happy to have uh, feedback on the show questions corrections it's always a, it's always a joy to be wrong on the internet. So be sure to send us your <laughs> corrections and and so on on the show. Um, this episode will be going out on uh, Saturday. Oh, I can't do the maths quickly enough. Uh, we're recording this on Tuesday the eighth. This episode will be going out on Spotify and all good podcasting services on the twelfth. And then the YouTube version, if you wanna, if you prefer to listen to your podcast through YouTube, uh, will be going out on the thirteenth on our YouTube channel. Um, so yeah, that's it. Thank you very much for listening and we'll speak to you again uh, next week. Thank you very much, Amit. Thank you, Brianna. Thank you Thank for you. having me. <laughs> See you all soon. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.